Okay, wonderful. So, so as Anna said, I uh, I got my PhD from the iSchool in 2018. I worked on kind of problems around biosensing and uh, privacy and security concerns around biosensing devices. And after I graduated, I started as a postdoc at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. And at some point during my postdoc in 2019, I think it was Steve asked me about internet fragmentation, which is the idea basically that the internet is growing national borders, that it's becoming different in different places, that it's becoming less global. And he asked me a question to the effect of, what's going on? Is this real? Has anyone actually measured this? And the answer at that time was no, no one had actually measured this. So I started researching internet fragmentation and measuring it. And I fell down this rabbit hole that went through kind of structural risks to the internet and all of these other things. But I've, I've fallen out of this rabbit hole in a sort of unexpected place, which I think is a kind of an unorthodox perspective on how to improve most people's experience of the internet. And this talk is my attempt to provide, I think, a more efficient route to the place where I'm at, which is, in a phrase, a localist perspective on the global internet. And it's a perspective that I think can help us resolve some of these massive and mess messy questions in internet governance. Because the ultimate question about the internet is, why is nobody happy with it? Nobody is fully satisfied with this internet. Free, quote unquote, governments have a fake news problem. Authoritarian governments have a real news problem. Activists have a surveillance problem. Everybody has a cybersecurity problem. Surveillance capitalists are the closest to happy, maybe, but even they are getting called up in front of US Congress for stuff that goes on in, on in cyberspace. So this is just not a peaceable kingdom. And cyber war, which I think we all have an intuition for at this point is brewing. Um, and we've seen kind of profit motivated skirmishes with things like ransomware. And we've seen state backed espionage attacks with things like Stuxnet, um, but, but state backed coordinated conflict, cyber war could, could really be quite devastating. I, I think devastating to the scale of medieval siege and, and with much of the same kind of domestic effects uh, like mass starvation and, and things like that. And, and the issue that confounds progress on any of these problems is that the conflicts that underlie them are so multifaceted and so multi-stakeholder that they become hard to reason about in any human scale way. And in a phrase, I think, we have a global empire, the internet, that cannot react to or reflect local needs. And empires that fail to reflect local needs historically have tended to fall apart and often very ungracefully. So I want to make these problems a bit more human scale, because I, I really do believe that that's the only way we can ever work our way out of these problems through a smaller, more Dunbar friendly scale of coordination around what the internet is and what the internet should be. And that is why I've called this talk, the internet on the ground. Okay, so I call this talk, the internet on the ground. Now here's a photo of the earth from space, the literal opposite of the ground. But I like this photo. This photo helps to remind me that the internet is finite. Yes, it feels endless, but there is indeed only so much internet. Maybe I'm missing some satellites and deep space probes here, but materially it does end. There is an inside and an outside. I hope that that relaxes you. I realize that my work can be a little bit stressful. It's kind of part of doing cybersecurity, but it's good to have perspective. And perspective is ultimately what I wanna give you today. I want to help you experience this internet as something that is on the ground. But it makes sense to start from space, I think. Um, the internet is global in its reach and its impact for one thing. The internet is also a common, like the planet is a common. But also this view, this planetary view is very much how the internet's early proponents saw it. They had transnational aspirations. They had global aspirations. And if we don't understand how they saw it, we have no chance of understanding this, a grassroots internet in Havana that runs through the streets peer to peer, grandmas restarting Raspberry Pis to make routing messages propagate. This is a different internet, street net. It's built in a different way. It's adopted to the local material conditions, think trade embargoes, and it's structured by a different ideology, an ideology that cared about fundamentally different things. So this internet is not the only possible internet 
The internet we're using, the one we're speaking over, is one of many internets that could have been designed, that could have become global. But this is the big one. This is the hegemonic one. This is the internet. So what I want to explain to you by way of introduction here is why is this the one? Why this one? Of all the internets, why is this the internet that we're talking over? And once we understand that, I think we can understand a lot better what problems the internet is facing, what they are, where they come from, and how we can go about solving them. But to begin, we have to go back to this planet. The year is 1967. And this photo, taking this photo, was very much central to an ongoing power conflict between the United States and the USSR, or at least typified by the leadership of those two nations, those two states. And this conflict plays out technologically primarily. Remember, this is a cold war. Yes, we're building nukes, but we're also just pouring all of this money into scientific research. Because at a certain point, it just doesn't make sense to be manufacturing tanks for a war we're not fighting. So this is kind of the only circus in town, so to speak. And this is where the internet begins. This internet was a US military project. And its goal was primarily to serve US's, the US's international interests, military communications that could withstand international conflict. And only later did this internet move into the realm of the domestic, into the realm of the commercial. And the domestic is seen as the commercial in the eyes of US policymakers in the 1990s who promote its adoption at home and abroad. But this is ahead of where we need to be. Forget all of that for now. It's 1967. And a RAND Corporation employee named Paul Barron writes this paper about communication networks. He's funded by the Air Force, and, and they're interested, the Air Force, in building a communication network that routes around failure. Something gets bombed, you can still deliver the message. And he draws these three diagrams, which go on to have an outsized impact in, in kind of global technological development. He says, A on the left here is no good. Obviously, this one thing gets bombed, the whole network goes down, no one can send messages to anyone. Now, C, on the far right here, is the most resilient to attacks. You can bomb anything, but everything will always route around. But B here, somewhere in the middle, is pretty resilient to attacks. It's not distributed, but it's decentralized. There is no one center, and it splits the difference. Because you can optimize these connector nodes a bit, to get a little bit better performance. But if you take down one of the connector nodes, there's still perhaps an alternative route. And he has some graph theory to prove this. He has some math to prove this. But the US military apparatus really gets B. They really jive with B in a huge way that is not mathematical at all. It's purely intuitive, which is that it looks like the highway system in the United States. Because this highway system was considered hard to bomb by the Eisenhower era officials who mostly made up ARPA leadership at that time. You have a lot of highways, you have a few connections throughout the highways, and that lets you route around the failures. You don't need every highway to connect to every other highway to get that resilience. If one of the highways gets bombed, you can route trucks around. So this is more than a communications network at this point. This becomes ideological. This is about pride in this other recent infrastructure development project that uh, the interstate highway system, that is, which was both good for securitization and good for private industry and good for consumers. It was a win-win-win infrastructure project after um, uh, World War II. So this network begins by following truck stops, literally. ARPA administers this grant to a bunch of higher ed institutions, and they built this out, and they called it ARPANET. ARPA, because ARPA funded it, and you got to please the funders and net because it was a network. It was a network of networks. Small local networks are kind of easy to make. You just connect all the computers to a central point called a router. But now we can connect that central point, that router, to other routers. Now we have a network of networks. Here's what it looks like in 1970. And you can see from the institutions on this map that the people who are administering this network aren't exactly US military establishment. They're a bunch of basically research scientist university staff. They're both mostly non-tenure track staff who rely on external grants, for example, uh, US military grants. 
For example, there are people like Joe Postel here, and they're kind of hippies. They're not such hippies that they refuse to take money from the US military, but they're kind of hippies. And uh, Joe Postel here, and by the way, this is kind of an aside, but he intentionally broke the entire internet in the 1970s to prove a point about a really basic security flaw in internet routing. And the plot twist of all of this is that we still have that security flaw today. That is a story for, for another time, unfortunately. The point here is that these are the people who started to grow the internet. They started to scale it up and build it out. They made the thing work. They built Unix commands that are still on your computer today. They built the DNS, which is how we access names like nytimes.com instead of memorizing some IP address. In, in effect, they took this idea of uninternet and they built some internet, some specific internet. And it actually kind of worked. It worked, it worked okay. It wasn't amazing, but it did do stuff and it became useful. And in 1991, the internet grew to look like this. It's now called the NSFNet. NSF is the National Science Foundation, which is another big but non-military government funder. And they tend to fund stuff when it may have more domestic interest or even basic science interest and ideally a bit of both, um, which was certainly the case with, with this project. In fact, at this point, it's pretty clear that this internet has transnational aspirations. We can make this thing go all the way around the world. Everyone can share this one network and everyone can address packets to anyone. And this is going to change everything in a way that very few people understand because people generally at this time do not get the concept of an application that can accept some application specific logic routed through generic packets through some generic network. But some people understand it. And they are the weird hippie folks and their friends who have been maintaining and building out the system since the 70s. And while obviously these people are deeply complicit in the US government's goals and desires here, they are, I think, my read at their core agents of the 1960s counterculture. And they often famously read the whole Earth catalog, which happens to use the photo of the Earth I showed you in the beginning from 1967. They may be familiar with this poem, which I link through to in the slide notes. I like to think it has to be of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and join back to nature, return to our mammal brothers and sisters and all watched over by machines of loving grace. This is 1967. And this idea, this ethos, and even some of the aesthetic qualities of this culture recur again and again throughout the development of the internet. This is Roddy Perlman, who invented spanning tree protocol or STP. If you've ever used a computer, you can pretty much thank her for this. And in the paper where she introduced this concept, she wrote a poem, I think that I shall never see a graph more lovely than a tree, a tree whose crucial property is loop-free connectivity. But this is more than aesthetic, of course. This is ideological. This techno-utopian thinking spreads from the technical very quickly into the realm of the social. Perhaps it was social all along. And it does so in a way that calcifies around this idea that the internet is going to make it hard to oppress speech, hard to oppress free association between the world's people. This is a really key idea. And at this time, the early 90s, this early web activist, John Gilmore, famously said, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. Remember, this is much the same logic that the early ARPANET developers who liked that, you know, similar to the US highway system, this network was able to route around failure. The height of this, in my mind, comes in 1996, when a guy named John Perry Barlow gives a speech called the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. He proclaims, governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. Ironically, the venue at which he made this proclamation was Davos, the conference for billionaires. So while national interests were still at the center here, we already see the capital class congregating around the margins, and we'll return to them in a moment. For now, back to the US. This idea of the internet rounding around failure filtered through this perspective that John Gilmore kind of typifies in 93, 
and really structures how the Clinton administration thinks about the internet. Here in 2000, Bill Clinton says, Beijing has been trying to crack down on the internet. Good luck. That's sort of like trying to nail jello to the wall. And as we all know, he was 100% right. You can never censor anything on the internet. But remember, this was 2000. This was the end of history as it was infamously proclaimed at that time. Democracy, quote unquote, was sweeping across the globe. And the historical question at that time was whether authoritarian regimes could survive the internet. Today, the question is whether the internet can survive authoritarian regimes. But again, getting ahead of myself, 2000, the global spread of the internet is tied up in globalization writ large, in global trade, in global commerce, in global exchange. And this internet thing was really going to change that and change it, it did. Does anyone recognize this guy? Maybe Anna recognizes this guy. This is the pets.com spokes puppet. But this is the 2000s.com boom, and this boom was insane. A crazy number of deals were going on that made absolutely no sense. And if you're my age, your parents probably lost money in this. But, but, and then, yes, the boom, you know, it, it busted as, as, all, as all kind of boom and bust cycles go. But, but in the long term, the institutions kind of stuck around. The idea of venture capital, the idea of hockey stick growth, that model, and the tech companies that started with that model that are still here today have flourished. In a way, they built the net, and I do not make any friends when I say this, in a way, they built the net better than the hippies did. They kind of made it more stable, more usable, definitely, more performant, more accessible, in many ways more secure than the internet was, is by design. In fact, these companies have become the internet. Never mind that they own the software infrastructure, as we'll talk about in a moment. They increasingly own the physical infrastructure. Starting in 2011, a group of uh, traders got together to build some private internet infrastructure. They built a private microwave link to connect Wall Street with Chicago for better high frequency trading. By today, companies like Facebook and Google build their own undersea cables alongside national governments to connect countries throughout the global south. Facebook's to Africa cable pictured here is about the same length as the circumference of the earth. In the 2000s, debates about net neutrality feared that telecom companies like Comcast would partner with service providers to selectively filter content. Facebook is free. If you want HBO, you'll have to pay us more. But what happened by the 2010s is that the content providers became telecoms. They built private infrastructure to which no expectation of neutrality applied. Today, in much of the South Pacific, countries like Vanuatu, Fiji, Tonga, which are of particular interest to me, the only internet you connect, connection that you can get is to Facebook products and nothing else. Remember, when Facebook's BGP outreach brought down the entire, entirety of all of their products worldwide for a day in October, in those countries, for most working people, the internet was off. All of the internet was off. So the story of the internet so far is this. The US military wanted to beat the Soviets on tech. So they built a communications network that turned out to be more useful than anyone imagined. In the 1990s, a small but influential group of techno-utopians planted a liberatory flag in this network. And business people influenced by the libertarian aspects of those utopians' ideology built private companies that flourished and consolidated and flourished and consolidated until those companies became the internet itself. Those companies helped the U.S. achieve some degree of economic growth. They helped the U.S. build a global reach for domestic products. But somewhere along the way, the U.S.'s deference to private enterprise got the better of it. And today, Tech companies, the private fiefdoms the American internet minted, compete for power with the state that birthed them. As John Perry Barlow prophesied, someone was granted independence in cyberspace, albeit a partial and complex kind. But it was not us. It was the participants of Davos Conference Future, the owners and shareholders of the mostly US domiciled corporations that now provision this internet as we experience it. And those corporations themselves 
compete with nation states for power and influence. The ongoing conflicts between Facebook and the US government over political news or between Apple and the US government over encryption are at their core questions about those companies' ability to adequately participate in the US's regime of securitization. So what does this conflict between the US government and its tech companies look like? Well, remember, the, US, the internet here is decentralized, not distributed. That means that while there is no one center, there are several key control points, control points upon which pressure can be applied. Some of that pressure only matters locally, like blocking websites in your territory, you know, which is what China does with the Great Firewall. It's inaccessible to you. But some are global. Some control points affect the entire world. Those control points represent the parts of this internet that are globally shared. Imagine, instead of making a website blocked in China, you make it blocked for everyone. That's a global control point. So what are these control points and who owns them? One perspective on this is kind of what happens when you visit a website. This is what happens. Don't read this. The point of this chart is that it's overwhelming. We have to simplify. We have to identify a finite number of types of institutions that everyone relies on. Here are six. I identified these earlier this year, working with the Internet Society. This work is greatly influenced by the work of David Clark. Um, and, and remember, forget your local ISP like Comcast, who can maybe decide what you see. These are the institutions that manage what everyone in the world sees. Now, of those institutions, what proportion of them by market share are based in the United States? What proportion of them use services based in the United States? And the answer is a lot. In fact, the ones that it's arguably easiest to route around web hosts, data centers, where the goods are kind of fungible and you can move between providers pretty easily, those are less US dominated. The ones that are really troubling are the things it's hard to route around, like naming or securing your traffic. Let's start with naming. Let's start with domain names. I love domain names. First of all, I think they're hilarious because they're clunky and they don't work very well. And they're really, really old and like, what is .com? But, but I love them because the benefits of global naming really are enormous. There is one human readable string that maps to exactly one web resource for the entire world. That is incredible. But how do you get one? Well, first you go to a domain registrar, someone like GoDaddy, and you say, I want substack.com, please. So they go to a domain uh, registry backend, .com domain, uh, top level domain, or TLD, which you see here. And they say, hey, are there any uh, domain names in the .com TLD called substack? .com TLD comes back and says, no, you know, there's no substack here. And the domain registrar can now go on and sell the domain uh, to someone else. And, and the, the TLD makes a fee or whatever that might work. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the backend registry makes a fee or however that might work. But these registrars and these registry backends are companies and nonprofit organizations. And they are based somewhere. And by volume, 66.3% of domains in the world of pe that people visit, and something like 99% of the world's most popular domain names, are registered on top levels where the registrar or registry backend is domiciled in the United States. So if you're the United States federal government, you can, in theory, issue a court order to one of these registry backends or registrars and say, hey, give me this domain name. It's been involved with the crime which is exactly what they do. There is an operation called Operation in Our Sites, which is administered by ICE, the uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement, which has seized about 1.2 million websites so far by going to registrars or registry backends and doing civil forfeiture. This has literally meant seizing US citizens' domain names and holding them without due process. And, th and there's a great paper about this in the slide notes, which I'll share after this talk. The upshot is that anywhere in the world, you can own a domain name. And if that domain name happens to be administered by the US, US organization in some way, it can be seized by the US government. Your, your website still exists, but no one knows how to reach it because they only know it as chinaseatbelt.com or whatever. So it, it, may, it may as well not exist. There's no name. This operation has been mostly aimed at copyright historically, but earlier this year, Operation in our sites 
used this mechanism to seize an Iranian news site, which had the bad luck of having a .NET TLD alleging disinformation. There's more information about that in the slide notes. So far, only TLDs have been subject to this regime, but I have a really strong hunch that at some point we're going to see this applied to other types of services. SSL certificates are a great candidate. If you've ever seen that lock in your browser uh, next to the URL bar, that's because someone somewhere, a certificate authority, issued a valid, valid TLS certificate for that site. That site uses this certificate to encrypt its traffic to you. And your browser looks at the certificate and says, yes, this is really the site. And, and here's the decrypted website and shows you that lock to let you know you're not being fished. It's authenticated and encrypted. The problem is that the certificate authority system has this really bad design where that authority can both revoke that certificate at any time and also issue a valid certificate for any other site. Um, the upshot of all of this is that the US government could, in theory, go to the certificate authority for a particular website and say, hey, revoke the certificate, and the user would see something like this. This is really convenient for the United States because browsers are the ones that get to decide which certificate authority is to trust. And that's Google, Mozilla, and Apple, basically. And they're all based in the United States, and they all trust American certificate authorities, which is why we see such a concentration uh, uh, here in SSL certificates, you get the idea. Another key control point, which you've probably noticed because it's the highest number in this uh, graph, are proxy services. These are also known as content distribution networks or CDNs. They include players like Akamai, Cloudflare, Fastly. CDNs sit in between you, the user, and the content that you're requesting. They put the content geographically close to you, which is more efficient. They also filter your content to make sure that you are not nefarious, that you are not an attacker. They're kind of the bouncer of the internet in a way. I really, really like to troll people who work at these companies. I'm truly on the record saying that Cloudflare should be nationalized, and I've linked through to that in the slide notes. And the reason that I'm hard on them is that they are so ripe for both political control and cyber attacks. Has anyone here ever used Tor? maybe a few people. Tor is an amazing technology, set of technologies that helps people remain anonymous on the internet. However, in practice, it is a pain to browse with. That's because of CDNs. They basically have a policy, most of them, of just blocking Tor traffic or making you do a, a captcha to assume to, to see that you're human. Now, maybe there's a good reason for this. Maybe this prevents DDoS attacks. It also makes regular surveillance capitalism kind of way of browsing the internet way easier, which is definitely good for Cloudflare's customers whose business models rely on selling targeted advertising. But uh, this is not just kind of a small concern about targeted advertising. This demonstrates CDN's capacity to filter at a fine-grained level what people see and consider, again, their dominance and the dominance of the US-based CDNs over the global provisioning of the internet. And it's not just little complaints like this. From the perspective of the average user, CDNs are the internet. When Fastly, for example, went down, a lot of the internet went down. CNN, Amazon, the UK government's website, gov.co.uk. So let's see what the news said about this outage on the day it happened. Brian Stelter is here for us in New York. Brian, I don't ever have to remind you about the real world implications for this. You follow it so closely. You know, you pointed out that this outage was so widespread that there was this quick ripple effect, like the kind that we just pointed out there. It might be largely over now, but what's the collateral damage here? Well, if it feels like this is happening more often, that's because it is happening more often. This was one of the most widespread outages we've ever seen because it took down everything from Hulu and HBO Max to Spotify and CNN and the BBC. And as you're saying, even government websites. This was also notable because it was not restricted to one part of the world. This was affecting users in Europe, in the United States, in parts of Asia and Africa, all at the same time. Essentially what happened is Fastly installed a bad software update and its bad software update then spread and had that ripple effect. You know. It 
originally the reason why you have these content delivery networks like Fastly that are close physically to people's at homes and access points is to speed up the internet, is to make web pages and songs and everything play faster on your phones and computers. But when it goes down, it goes down hard. And, and that's what we saw earlier today. It's a reminder that there are only a small number of these cloud computing firms that are keeping essentially the entire internet online. When I say that, I mean the entire consumer internet. Of course, there's lots of redundancies, lots of different parts of the internet. But when you think about these major players, whether it's Hulu or Spotify or Reddit, all these big companies, they rely on the same handful of firms. So in the words of Recode, it's, it's both the scale today and the frequency of these outages that is what's worrisome. Yeah, absolutely. And when I just point out beyond everything you couldn't get done, right, this did affect the vaccine rollout in the UK. And of course, uh, that is something that people just can't afford, especially given what's going on right now. Now, unequivocally, I'd say, and I'm sure you'd agree, this proves the internet is infrastructure. And it's not really safeguarded nearly as well as it should be, right? In, the, in this case, there's no evidence this was a cyber attack, a case of ransomware. This seems to have just been a company that made a, you know, with a big hiccup that everybody then heard. Right, but doesn't you know, it's it make like you the nervous? It, make, it, makes, it makes me nervous, Brian. Doesn't it make you nervous? You said it was like a software update. Think yes, because that. because of all the scrambling in so many corners. Here at CNN, we started trying to figure out how do we get news onto the website? How do we share it on social media? You know, you had newsrooms scrambling, you had consumer entertainment companies scrambling, and government scrambling. Because when your app, when your website suddenly goes down, the viewers at home, you know, we have no idea what's going wrong. You have to wait to actually find out. Sometimes you might assume the worst. In this case, it seems like it was not the worst case scenario, but it is a reminder of how vulnerable this infrastructure is. Now, very rarely do internet infrastructure issues rise to the level of national news significance, but consider Fastly has only 5% of the CDN market. Cloudflare has 81% of the CDN market. Forget what the US government could do with court orders. What could a state-sponsored Stuxnet-level cyber attack do? Now, will the US federal government exert power over its tech companies? If so, will those tech companies accede to their demands as domain registrars and registry backends have to operation in our sites? We can't know. What we can know is that there are key control points over the entire internet. And whoever can control those control points pretty much controls what people can access. So there's a lot to be gained from controlling them, as we can see. While the central drama of the internet is, in my opinion, in the US for now, zooming out, and this would be a whole lecture in and of itself, this is not just a conflict between US corporations and the US federal government. Governments, companies, and people worldwide have their complaints about this internet. They don't like what's on it. They don't like what's kept off of it and they do what they can to get their way. Outside of the US, governments, whose control over physical infrastructure domestically allows them to filter content or just turn off the internet completely as we've seen repeatedly in India. Or they can build their own infrastructure to compete with this infrastructure. And there are a lot of ways of looking at the situation. On one hand, maybe the internet is a global or common good similar to global trade conceptually. There's this theory of international relations called hegemonic stability theory, which basically predicts that a common good will always be provisioned by a hegemon as long as that hegemon remains predictable in its actions. I linked more about this in the slide notes. On the other hand, yeah, not everyone is happy with this internet. In the EU, if you don't like kind of the way that companies are dealing with uh, people's private data, you can do something like GDPR, which maybe has a pretty pronounced global effect where suddenly everyone is asking if you're okay with cookies, even if you're not in Europe, that's kind of a content blocking strategy. On the other hand, maybe it's better to build your own control points internally. Then you can kind of have the best of both worlds. You can interoperate partially with this internet blocking websites you don't like and maybe making alternative websites internally as China does. We actually found in a paper earlier this year, which I linked through to in the slide notes, that the websites you block reflect real world alliances. We measured what kind of websites were blocked everywhere in the world and we compared globally each country to each other country. We found that similarities in the websites you block are strongly predictive of who you trade with 
who you're in military alliances with, stuff like that. Um, the paper is again in, in the notes here. The point is that struggles over the internet reflect power conflicts broadly. And they probably go on to shape those conflicts too. The internet is, in other words, constitutive of geopolitics, a lever to further it, a driver of it, and a stage on which it plays out, just like it was back when ARPA invented it. But today, there are a lot more stakeholders at the table. States and others compete and cooperate on this stage. Remember, these control points, the US has legal authority over them, maybe, but cyber attacks on them are a whole nother ball game and no one really knows what level of havoc that might wreak. What we have today is a dangerous, precarious situation, and we are not sure what's going to happen. Cyber war, ad hoc conflict that makes the internet unreliable for everyone, perhaps ending in a barren, unusable web. Fragmentation, siloed internets fragmented into national blocks that trade together. Countries outside that block connect only imperfectly or partially. Or hegemony, an internet that's truly global but globally censored and surveilled. Total control, a clamping down by the US state apparatus on this internet, perhaps riding it out until this internet becomes someone else's hegemony, China's hegemony, a corporation's hegemony like Meta's hegemony, or a consortium of corporations like in the 1992 novel Snow Crash, which coined the word metaverse in which the US had fallen completely to private interests which have divvied up the United States into privatized fiefdoms. This book undoubtedly inspired Mark Zuckerberg to build a metaverse thinking, hey, we could be one of those companies that takes over after the fall of the US. Listen, none of those internets sound very good to me. And this internet, it's always been in a state of flux, it always will be, but this internet was never really built with popular governance in mind. It was always a tool of power. It was built for powerful people, to do their power better. And it got away from its original designers in the US military in some ways that are surprising, maybe, but maybe not that surprising. The US military apparatus and the US higher ed system and the US private industrial apparatus are all kind of cozy with each other. I think this internet is mostly serving its goal. And I think that it's pretty much captured by state and capital interests. And let me start here now with a thesis. And this is a conclusion I've come to, and I can debate it, but I'll just assert it for now. The issue isn't that control points over the internet exist. It's that you have no say in the ones that affect you. The issue isn't that control points exist. It's that there's no popular governance over them. While some aspects of the internet are deeply de democratic in completely non-governmental bodies, the real power points of the internet have become nestled away inside of corporations, which are in turn nestled inside of securitized states. There is no place in these control points for interests that are neither state required nor profit motivated. There is no room for local communities. There is no room for popular governance. There is no room for popular veto, except to stop using the internet which isn't really a choice because how would you get paid? So at this point, I have to address blockchain. I'm sorry, I didn't want to do this, but I have to do this. Blockchains, like Bitcoin, let's say Bitcoin. Bitcoin relies only on the protocol layer of the internet. They work on IP and BGP. While they do not replace the internet's most fundamental material infrastructure with, with in, which interconnects nodes, they do throw the application stack of the internet out the window. They provide another possible application stack. And that in and of itself, creating an alternative application layer is actually kind of amazing. I hate the way Bitcoin does it with proof of work, which is an ongoing environmental disaster. I hate that projects like Ethereum, which aim to provide the common good of reproducible computation at scale still haven't moved away from proof of work to proof of stake, despite many high performance implementations of proof of stake in networks like Cosmos. And of course, 
I hate blockchain's roaring 20s speculative public face. Eric Adams getting his first three checks as New York mayor and Bitcoin, the public UC Berkeley funding its operation through NFTs of the CRISPR patent, DAOs buying the constitution of the United States because scroll emoji, Ali Braylon and Mother Jones recently described the speculative phenomenon as the only rational response to an irrational market. Hey, NFTs may be a scam, but so is the economy. But that's a debate for another day. None of that is my complaint about blockchain today. My complaint about blockchain today is that even the blockchain folks who are well-meaning, which is some very, very small subset of the community who work on kind of non-grift projects like Helium and Cosmos and Juno, believe in this sort of naive technological determinism sometimes. They want to do the revolution, but they think they can party while they do it because they think their tech will do the revolution for them. That's never how it works. That did not work out for the techno-utopians. If this community, even the good parts of this community, isn't careful, they will deliver their technologies to the same state and capital interests as their predecessors. One person who isn't naive about this, by the way, is Ethan Buckman, who I linked to here, linked to in the, in the uh, slide notes. This is a truly heterodox person who really influences me. Uh, and, and one of his core observations is that the original network of networks was the empire. Empire connected smaller societies and forced them to interoperate. That was its innovation. You erase their religion, erase their language, force them to take a new religion, you can extract surplus value that way. You can make a hegemon. And in a way, this internet is kind of that empire taken to its logical conclusion. It connects with caveats, but basically connects all of the network of networks. At one point in the past, maybe this one internet served the whole world better than it does today, maybe. But today, this internet doesn't please anyone, let alone everyone. It doesn't respond to the needs of people on the ground. And once empires stop responding to the needs of people on the ground, historically, they have a tendency to break apart. Here's a poll I did on Twitter, very unscientific poll. I asked, speculative question for you. Currently, almost all of the internet's users share the same DNS domain name system, providing global consensus on naming, which names are valid, what they map to, et cetera. For how much longer will that be the case? And a majority, 54%, were pessimistic that global naming will last another 10 years. The people who thought it would last another 20 were really a minority, 27%. So the experts kind of agree we're headed toward, in some way, in some sense, a multiplicity of internets. The only question in my mind is whose internets will they be? The states, the corporations, or the peoples? Because a multiplicity of internets may not be such a bad thing. Maybe we need more Havana street nets, local self-sovereign networks that connect partially, imperfectly to this global internet. There is no rule that there can only be one internet. If there's any one thing, in fact, that binds together almost all of the, internet's, uh, the internet using population in the entire world under one experience, it's that no matter where you go, there is only one internet on offer. You don't get to choose which internet you see. Whatever service provider you decide to go with, whatever choice you have, there will be some finite amount of content available to you. And unless you're really rich or really crafty, that's the internet you're getting. And that's why no matter where you go or who you talk to in any country, no matter how different the internet is in all of these different places, People call it the internet. It's like the subway. In the world, there may be many subways, but to you, there is only one. So this is in some sense the purest form of control. It is the control of no alternative. So what would alternatives look like? They may look like this. The New York City mesh, pictured here, seeks to provide affordable sliding scale internet service faster and higher quality than the local telecom monopoly. Volunteers build radio towers on rooftops and manage routing tables. Others, like the mycelium mesh network built in the wake of the BLM protests of 2020, 
provides a backup network. Resilience, in the case law enforcement cuts telecommunications infrastructure to control a protest or civil unrest, a strategy pioneered by the BART police in 2012. Remember, this internet may be global, but your experience of this internet is always local. The internet to you is equivalent to its final hop to you. From your perspective, this internet is always on the ground. And that basic fact can make this internet very different in different places, particularly in authoritarian regimes, as we've discussed a bit. But it also opens up opportunities to build new internets. What to you looks like just a normal Wi-Fi network may in fact connect you to a completely different technological stack. The limit is really our ability to organize. Because at some scale of organization, there's this. This is Guifi.net, a mesh network centered, centered in Spain's Catalan region, a peer-to-peer -peer ISP that's explicitly anarchist in its ideology, blending community-run internet with goals for an independent Catalonia. Guifi connects about 37,000 machines, and it has no CEOs, no leaders. Anyone can build infrastructure and extend this network. The infrastructure they build becomes part of the commons. And speaking of the commons, let's return now to the earth. There are people who will tell you the internet will never fragment because the global shared communications network is too valuable for everyone. Like the climate, it's a good we cannot do without. And I don't disagree, but what parts of that network do we need to agree on? All of it, everything? Or is it possible to build something more confederated? a network of networks that connects globally, but voluntarily. So that's basically what I'm interested in now, how to build new internets that we can live with, fall back on, interoperate between, both technically and on the ground, how to organize to make robust communities. And it was a really long circuitous route to this area for me. I went through a long phase of trying to figure out where this internet was vulnerable and what kinds of outages could cascade into catastrophic failures that would cause like global trade to desynchronize. And I lost a lot of sleep over how to protect this internet. Now, I'm not so sure this internet is worth saving. Or rather, I don't think that that mission as such is the most tenable or even the most effective goal. I think the best goal is to make internets that work better, but at much smaller scales, at urban scales, at the scale of towns and cities, what Murray Bookchin calls the forefront of political life. I can envision a multiplicity of internets stitched together, a global confederalism. They can be local, self-sovereign, managed popularly within communities. They can interoperate carefully, pragmatically with this internet and with one another. And I'm not saying that every place in the world will have such an internet, but I'm saying that some place could, and we can invent infrastructure to power those internets, and we can invent institutions to govern those infrastructures. But it's not about the tech. It's about the organizing. It's about the story. We use this internet because it cohered to stories that were legible as liberation at the time. Yes, that flavor of liberation was a, of a distinctly neoliberal 20th century variety. It was a product of its time. But that doesn't have to be the end of history, the last internet the one internet to rule them all forever. In fact, it won't be. The problem is that no better internet has come next yet. From paranets for protesters to street nets in Havana, it seems to me that an ideologically trustworthy communications network will be a necessary prerequisite for any meaningfully liberatory struggle we might hope to achieve in our lifetimes. That network will be un-internet but perhaps not this internet. I wanna give a huge thanks to the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity and to Akilesh Pandita, Lily Bhattacharji, uh, Reina, Renata Barreto, Neha Mittal and Mahmoud Hamsho for helping with this research along the way. Um, I wanna open it up to kind of any questions you may have for now. Um, and I have a few more specific discussion questions if we decide to move to that later.